Welcome to Mayo Clinic Sleep Medicine Podcasts, a series for physicians, advanced practice providers, nurses, and other health practitioners treating sleep disorders or interested in learning about state-of-the-art advances in sleep medicine and sleep health. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Silber. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Maitri Juna. We are both consultants at the Center for Sleep Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today's topic is restless legs management, where does iron fit in? It has been known since the 1950s that iron deficiency can be associated with restless leg syndrome. But how should one assess patients for iron deficiency? And should iron supplementation be given for restless legs and how? My guest today is Dr. Michael Silber, Professor of Neurology at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science and a board-certified sleep specialist. Mike, how do you personally assess for iron deficiency in a patient with restless legs? And what are considered normal values for serum ferritin? Yes, well, thank you, Maithri. That's a really important question. And it's one which we've been thinking about a lot recently. Let me start by saying that every patient with restless legs, I do a clinical assessment for iron deficiency. I ask patients about any history of GI blood loss, um, any dark stools, any predisposing causes for GI blood loss, such as, for instance, heavy um, use of medications which can cause ulceration or dyspepsia. Um, in premenopausal women, I obviously ask about menorrhagia. And then something else that we don't always think about, I ask about whether they are altruistic blood donors. And if they're giving blood at sort of the maximum amount that is permitted, very often there is obligatory iron deficiency, not necessarily anemia, but this may be a factor as well. So I look at it clinically, but even in patients who have no features to suggest clinically that they might be overtly iron deficient, I tend to measure iron levels in almost everybody I see with restless legs. So what we do is we do a fasting um, serum ferritin and then serum iron and total iron binding capacity. And from the latter two, we can then calculate the percentage saturation. Now, the one important factor is to ask patients, are they on oral iron supplementation? Because if they are, they should really stop it at least three or four days before the iron levels are measured. And sometimes, of course, it's just combined in a multivitamin. And until the patient looks, they don't realize that they're taking iron. So just one little pointer there. Then what is normal? Well, serum ferritin is the most sensitive blood measure of systemic iron stores. But of course, it doesn't reflect iron levels in the brain at all. And we actually have no clinical way of measuring iron levels in the brain. Um, you can look experimentally at CSF ferritin. One can look at um, the M certain sophisticated MRI and ultrasound measurements of iron in the basal ganglia, but we don't use this clinically, so we're stuck with systemic measurements. The other problem is that ferritin is an acute phase reactant. So if your patient has acute or chronic inflammation or malignancy, um, th that may push up the ferritin to falsely high levels, such as somebody with active rheumatoid arthritis, as an example. And then the percentage saturation may be a better measure of systemic iron stores. So to go the other way around, the percentage saturation we look at as possibly low would be less than 20%, which brings us back to ferritin. Now, most chemical measures in the blood, it doesn't really matter what um, type of technique you use to measure. The normal levels are roughly the same, but we've re recently learned that serum ferritin is an exception, and the technique you use is um, very much depends, very much determines normal values. And at Mayo Clinic, we've recently moved from an, a method called the Beckman method to a method called the Roche method, a different laboratory. And to our surprise and consternation, the normal values changed fairly significantly. We used to say that we like to get levels into the high normal range, and we defined that as greater than 50 to 75 micrograms per, per liter. 
Um, but under the new Beckman measures, that converts to between 80 to 120 micrograms per liter. Very different, and we've had to change our recommendations. So the bottom line on that is, you know, you really have to know what method your lab's using and what are normal and low normal and high normal values, which again makes us think that perhaps, you know, the percentage saturation may actually be a better measure of what we're dealing with than ferritin, especially if you don't know what your normal values are. So that's what I measure. And um, then we go from there. That's very helpful, Mike. Thank you. So if you were to give oral iron, what preparations would you use? And how would you advise the patient to take them? Um, again, a very important topic because oral iron is very poorly absorbed into the body. And patients who take oral iron, we must expect three to six months before we see any significant movement in their systemic iron stores. So the first thing is, what level do we take? And again, with these new Roche uh, measurements, we say, well, it would be good to get people above 80 to 120. And we know that if they're above 120, for sure, we don't want to give oral iron because the transport mechanisms in the GI tract are saturated above that level. And the higher you get towards that 120, the less likely iron is going to be absorbed orally. So if it's below that, less than 80 or even between 80 and 120, we might say, let's try some oral iron supplementation. And the other thing is we used to say, <laughs> give oral iron three times a day. Now, the first thing is there's no patient in the world who hasn't got OCD who's going to take iron three times a day. Um, but there are now many studies showing that that actually reduces absorption. And we should give oral iron at most once a day and preferably only every second day. It also seems to be better absorbed at night. So we say one tablet of oral iron before bed, preferably every second night. And we'd like to combine that with vitamin C, which um, enhances absorption. Um, the one preparation that we use, sort of commercial preparation, which combines the two is Vitron C, but there's no reason why one has to use it. One can use any iron preparation that has about 65 milligrams elemental iron, whether it's iron sulfate or iron fumarate or ferrygluconate. But if it hasn't got vitamin C in it, we suggest 100 or 200 milligrams vitamin C with each dose. Could you speak a little bit about the indications for intravenous iron therapy? Yes, we're using that more and more. So when would we use IV iron? Well, the first indication would be somebody who's got um, low iron stores or low normal iron stores. We want to move it up, and they've been shown to be totally intolerant to oral iron. They get horrible GI symptoms, dyspepsia, or so much constipation, they just can't take it. The second would be someone in which there's a contraindication to oral iron, certain malabsorption syndromes. Commonest we see in practice is somebody who's had bariatric surgery and you don't really want to give iron orally. The third reason, and probably the commonest that we use in our rather specialized practice, would be people with really severe restless legs. And we get sent patients with horrible augmentation, high dose dopamine agonists. And we really want to give them as much relief as soon as possible. And we'll often use IV iron in that setting. Um, and the um, final one would be someone who you really want to get the levels up. You've put them on oral iron, you recheck at three months and there's been no movement in the ferritin and they're no better. And you might say, let's change from oral to intravenous iron. So those are the reasons we might consider IV iron. Are there specific intravenous iron preparations that you recommend, Mike? And what precautions should providers take when administering mm -hmm. these? How effective are they? Yes, you know, we want obviously an IV iron preparation where the iron gets a into the brain. It's no good if it is all taken up by the red cells and by the liver. And certain of the iron preparations rapidly dissociated from the, dissociate from the carbohydrate moiety and are taken up systemically before they can get into the brain. So we want an iron preparation which slowly dissociates from the carbohydrate moiety and it gives an opportunity for iron to get into the brain. And the two which we use most are low molecular weight iron dextran. You can't get high molecular weight anymore, thankfully, because it had a high uh, allergenicity, low molecular weight iron dextran and ferricarboxy maltose.
Most of the studies which have shown success in intravenous iron in restless legs have been done with ferric maltose, but they are open-label studies on low molecular weight iron dextran. There's been variable availability of iron dextran in the last couple of years, which might push one towards ferric maltose, but ferric maltose is generally more expensive, so it's really it's difficult to know which one to use in a specific patient. Some insurers cl- um, won't allow ferric maltose. If one's using low molecular weight iron dextran, we always give a test dose first because there's a slightly higher rate of anaphylaxis. It's still very low compared to ferric maltose. So we give 25 milligrams intravenously, wait a while. If there's no allergic reaction, we then give 975 milligrams in in normal saline um, infused over about an hour. And that's it, just a single dose like that. If we give ferric maltose, there are two ways of doing it. You can give it in two doses of 750 milligrams each two weeks apart, um, given fairly rapidly over 15 minutes, or a single dose of 1,000 milligrams. If the patient comes from a distance to see you, the 1,000 milligrams is often more convenient. Less than that doesn't seem to work. Now, even ferric maltose can cause allergic reactions, so you've got to give intravenous iron in a facility that can do resuscitation if necessary. We don't pre-medicate our patients, but we do have available methylprednisolone and other agents to treat a, a severe allergic reaction if needs be. Um, the other thing about ferric maltose has one unusual, I suppose, complication, which happens in really about 50% of patients, and that is a drops serum phosphate. Um, now, that doesn't seem to be of much clinical significance unless you're giving the ferric maltose for iron deficiency anemia, as opposed to just low iron stores like we do it in restless legs, and you give repeated infusions, especially in somebody who's got chronic blood loss, let's say telangiectasia of the GI tract and needs repeated infusions very frequently. And it only becomes symptomatic, this low phosphate with microfractures and osteomalacia. It seems if you give probably more than five doses of it, more than six grams of it in that sort of setting of chronic iron deficiency anemia. So I think it's pretty safe the way we use it and not to worry too much about that. But I do just mention it. When do we give it? Well, again, we used to say below 100 micrograms per liter, the old method now, that's gone up to 160 micrograms. But again, we don't really know. Those are guesswork figures. The much, much more important figure is we never give intravenous iron if the percentage saturation is less than 45%, is greater than 45%, because we don't want to overload the liver. Otherwise, really, the ferritin level, especially with these uncertainties of what methods being used, are is much less important, but a sort of cutoff figure with the Roche method would be less than 160, with the old Beckman method less than 100, but that's flexible. But the percentage saturation mustn't be above 45%. That's very helpful as well, Mike. Thank you. Are there any final messages that you would like to leave with our listeners? Mm Well, thank you. Yes, that iron homeostasis and iron levels are important in restless legs. There's, we think that low iron stores in the brain do affect restless legs, um, that we should always measure it under careful circumstances. Um, oral iron may play a role, but in these really severe cases, intravenous iron may be helpful. It's not a panacea. Even when we get everything right, lowish levels, intravenous iron given, it is only effective in about 50% of patients um, and may take several weeks to become effective, but we should not deprive our patients, especially these severely augmented ones from IV iron when it's indicated. And sometimes it's really wonderfully effective in giving them relief and avoids us going on to multiple other potentially toxic um, pharmacologic agents. Well, Thanks very much, Dr. Silber, for sharing your expertise with us today. And to our listeners, I hope you found today's podcast to be useful for your practice. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. If so, please tune in again through wherever you receive your podcasts as we discuss further topics in sleep medicine and sleep health. Thank you. Thank you.